Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. You are tuned in to the Christian and the culture. Joining me today, as always, are pastors Tim Baldwin and Brian Weatherspoon. Gentlemen, would you greet our audience this morning? Good day, Christian and the culture family. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, let's see what the Lord has to say today. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. God bless you, Christian and the Culture family. Always good to be with you. And once again, we have a hot topic, so stay tuned. Well, praise Amen. the Lord. It's always a joy to bring you portions mm -hmm. of the Word of God designed to challenge our walk with Jesus. You see, I'm convinced that many people are serving the Lord for the wrong motives. It seems as though we want God to authorize whatever we would like, and then we will tell people the Lord told us, the Lord said this, the Lord said that. But the Bible declares that the word of the Lord shall stand when every other thing that we are looking at, standing on, when it begins to fail, the only thing that will stand is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And we want to challenge you. We want you to begin to think in terms of how does God's word prepare us for the things that we are experiencing in the world today. So our broadcast is designed to help you think, to take a moment, pause, and to try to understand just what the will of the Lord is concerning many of the areas in our lives. Now, understandably, many have concerns about the current economic condition in the world. People are hungry. They're out of work. Situations seem to be getting worse each day. The political system just really is not working. Democrats are fighting Republicans. Republicans are fighting Democrats. And it seems like what we're hearing is that God is Republican. It seems that everything that's happening, the Lord is Republican and he's against Democrats. And so then we find that we're fighting against each other. And what does the Bible have to say about all of these things? Today, we'd like to address a central topic that has been shared with us by one of our listeners. This precious sister in the Lord really wants to know, why is it that church pastors today do not speak authoritatively about these sins that are present in our culture? Sins of homosexuality, sexual sins, sins of morality, and all the things that we are watching destroy our nation. Why is it there more of a biblical challenge concerning these issues? Pastor Brian? Uh, I'd like to say well, it all depends on what church you're going to. Uh, we do have many pastors, I believe, that are really preaching what I call a more hardline orthodox. Uh, they're really coming at it with the word. They're trying to do it. Here's the truth. Uh, because most pastors don't have huge platforms, you don't hear it as much. And the exchange for a huge platform is you can't say everything you really want to say because the world doesn't really want to hear that. We must be reminded that we are in the day where people, my sister, people want to gather unto themselves those that will say what their itchy ears want to hear. So hardline preaching, not really acceptable, but it is preached. But the larger platforms, you're probably being asked to say something else. Pastor Tim, this precious saint writes us and she says, are you and the pastors, that means the three of us, are we saying that the Christians should not be involved at all in the political process and in speaking to the social issues of the world today? Is that what we're saying? Uh, Bishop, I don't believe we're saying that at all. I, I think our, some of the shows will bear that out, that over time we have spoken about having a civic duty and, and having a kingdom duty as well. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've always said is that there is no political party that will totally encompass uh, what we believe as uh, kingdom citizens. But I think, you know, we have to take a hard line at uh, what is our responsibility as believers and how do we influence the culture? How do we influence those who are in political positions uh, to, uh, to institute 
uh, laws that will benefit the believer, that will benefit our country. But what people have to understand is that when, when, when presidents and elected officials are elected, they are elected for the entire country. And so, so the system can't be uh, totally skewed towards a, a, a Christian belief system. That's why the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. We are the lights of the world. Didn't say that, that the president would be or our elected officials would be. And so right. we have a greater responsibility than to just say we can or cannot be political. Uh, we have a, a more of a responsibility to be more influential from a kingdom perspective. She continues to ask, may a pastor educate the people as to what the candidates' positions are on issues and encourage what she calls voting for righteousness? How do we address that? I mean, we do have a mandate to, to proclaim the gospel, to speak to the things of God. But how far should we go on the issues of today? Yeah, Pastor you know, Brian, Bishop, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Pastor Brian? Yeah, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, and I don't know if there's one cut out answer for that. I think every believer has to then kind of go within their own personal conviction. You know, how far do I go with supporting uh, someone and, and kind of casting my vote? The truth is, on both levels, whether it's Democrat or Republican, from a believer's perspective, we're looking for the lesser of two evils. There's going to be some evil on both sides. <laughs> We're just looking for the lesser evil. And that's probably the closest we'll get in an official. But as far as what we support and what we speak out against, I mean, every believer has to have their own conviction to know when to cut it off. And your vote is cast, but you leave it up to God. And, uh, and that's kind of where I stand on it. Pastor Tim. Yeah, you know, Bishop, again, it's, it's when we look at both parties, uh, in regard to her letter, I do think it's okay for us as, as pastors and leaders to lay out the issues, you know, to lay out the issues and say, here are the issues and, and have a platform to explain those. But, but, but we sort of blur the uh, lines and we get on shaky ground when we start endorsing one yeah. political candidate over another. And we're, we see that happening today. And, it, and it's almost become idolatry. It's almost become, we become more political and more patriotic uh, than we are kingdom. But, but again, I do, I do believe that it's okay to, to talk about the issues. But when sure. we look at it on a whole, Bishop, you know, again, I stand by what I said, where there is not one political party that will encompass everything about us. If, you know, one side is pro-life, the other side is, is, is you know, uh, is not pro-life. The other side is conservative. And, you know, and when you look at both sides, it's like, okay, one side is this and one side is the other. Then when you look at the one side is conservative, they have several opportunities over the years to, to, and because, you know, abortion is one of the big issues for conservatives and it should be, we sh we are against abortion. But when you look at it, every candidate who had uh, control of both house and Senate never abolished and made it and made abortion uh, illegal. They, they've never done it, but they their platform says that we're against it. And so, again, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is that is your are they really against it or or is this a ploy to get votes and to to keep the conservative party on the side of the Republicans? Yeah. Um, one of the things that this listener wrote to us uh, about was whether or not the preachers for the Lord's kingdom should be vocal in their speech about sins and speak against those sins uh, that are growing in our culture and in our world. Not just uh, abortion and things of that nature, but how about injustice, racism, things okay. like that, that strike to the very core of the love of God. Should we be vo uh, verbal? about those things? Should we be more vocal speaking out against those things that really, as Solomon said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Should we be more vocal speaking against those little foxes that are ruining the fabric of our society? Pastor Brian? Absolutely. Uh, most of the time, and you've heard me say it before on this program about keeping the prophetic message. And most of the time, people think when you say prophetic, you're thinking about future telling or forth telling. But no, keeping the prophetic message is exactly what John the Baptist did 
and it got him in trouble when he confronts a national sin. And he tells Herod, the leader, that you, what, you, what you are doing, leader, is wrong. Being with your brother's wife is wrong, and you're going to have to pay for that. And for it, it, you know, ultimately, he's beheaded because of it. So we understand keeping the prophetic message in our churches, if we ever have a public platform, then, yeah, I mean, you know, at some point we have to really pray for wisdom, you know, ask the Holy Spirit how to approach it. But at some point we do need the prophetic message needs to come back forward to get back to God. Wow. Pastor Tim, what do you think? Yeah, you know, when we look at when we look at the uh, the Gospels, when we look at Jesus's ministry, you know, it talks about, you know, giving sight to the blind and setting the captive free and, you know, all of those things. The gospel is justice, is social justice. Jesus was for social justice. And, you know, again, we do have a responsibility to speak against sin, to 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 teach these things in a way that allows believers and the world to see that there is a distinction between who we are and who the world is. And we do, again, we have a responsibility to do that. Absolutely. But have we become so enculturated that we really miss the message of God? What is the message of God? What is the gospel? Now, I know Paul says that the gospel is the birth, the life, the death, the burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Yes. But what is the gospel message when you say that we are supposed to speak the message of the kingdom? How do we, how do we combine that to the issues, the social injustice, the society ills, the, uh, the growth of sin and ungodliness? How do we speak to that in this culture? How do we tell the people that we see every day what God wants for them? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pastor Brian. So, uh, Pastor okay. Tim, go ahead. You start it. So, so, Bishop, when you talk about the gospel, the gospel is, we know, again, you said the good news, right? But it's the good news of the coming kingdom. It's the good news of the kingdom of God, right? And so, so when we speak in terms of the gospel, the gospel is not just for salvation. The, the gospel encompasses peace. It encompasses everyday living. It encompasses everything uh, that when, when we speak about our lives, that's what the gospel is for. It's for healing. And overall, so it's for redemption. The gospel speaks, speaks of God's mission to redeem his creation back to him and all of what that looks like. But, you know, Pastor Brian talks about this all the time about, you know, the culture being uh, or, or cultures not being redeemable, but people are. That's what the gospel yeah. is about. The gospel yeah. is about the redemption of humanity. We yeah. are in the center of the gospel. We yeah. play a role in that because the gospel is about God's creation. Amen. 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 Now, go ahead, Pastor. Amen. You sure? Okay, so yeah, I mean, Jesus said it and he summed it up like this, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And, and it's kind of the whole encompassing message of the gospel. And my understanding is if, if you have enough love for yourself to take care of you, then it will lend you the compassion for somebody else, which opens the door for dealing with injustice. There's no way to see injustice and not have a feel for it. There's no way to see, you know, social ills and not have some level of heart bleed for what's going on if I have a practice of loving my neighbor. That's the gospel. In Revelation chapters two and three, uh, we see the messages to the seven churches. Yes, sir. In my humble opinion, the scariest ones are Ephesus because they were doing work without loving him. Yeah. Thyatira because they allowed people with so-called titles to run through the church and lead the people into sinful behavior. Yes, sir. And Laodicea, who yeah. really found themselves extremely arrogant and prideful based upon the accumulation of riches. Yes. Do we see those three churches modeled more today than at any time in the history of the church? And here's my principal thought. Why did God save us? What was, what was the purpose in saving us? Yeah. What, what's the purpose? Pastor Brian? Uh, well, the Lord's purpose, one, is to, to change us so that we can help change somebody else. 
And, and as he saves us, we're supposed to then go and reach and touch everybody else. And ultimately, it is to worship, to praise him, to bring glory to him. But the real message is you got to reach somebody else. Okay, so your thought is God saves us to reach other people for him. Yes, sir. Okay, Pastor Tim, what's your thought? Yeah, I would I would add that God is into or wants to restore his image to his creation, yeah. you know, and everything about that. You know, when you talk about again, we look at from the garden, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, everything about what God was doing was about restoring his creation, restoring his image. When the Bible says that we were created in his image and in his likeness, we lost that in the garden. We lost yeah. We lost his image. We, we forfeited our right to eternal life. And so, so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, and he sends his son as the redeemer to redeem his, mm -hmm. his, his children, his creation back to him. And, and again, as I said, we are in the middle of the gospel. We are in the center of that because, God's, because God is, is uh, again, using us or using, you know, himself to redeem us back to him. So, so again, mm -hmm. I would, that, that's what I would add to it, that God is restoring his image uh, in, uh, upon his creation. Now, when I, when I mentioned those three churches before, my view is that those three churches had one thing in common, and that was they were pulling away from the Lord. His rebuke towards them yeah. was because they substituted intimacy with him for things, positions, and people. Yeah. Now, both of you have concluded that our purpose, one of the purposes for us being born again, is to reach other people, bring them in to further the kingdom of God. For me, in my practical way of thinking, I just wonder if God did not save us just to have fellowship and relationship with him and everything else is kind of like an addition because he rebukes the church at Ephesus because they're doing works. They're doing evangelism. They're doing all the church work. He rebukes Thyre and Tyra because they've allowed somebody to come in and draw them away from intimacy. He rebukes Laodicea because they've replaced him with an accumulation of worldly goods. I'm seeing some sign of correlation, some type of correlation here that God is after relationship with us. How would it be if we work to fulfill the relationship with God at the expense of church work? What do you think would happen if all we did was love God? Pastor Brian? We'd probably be shut up in a vacuum. I mean, we, we'd almost be like, the, it's, it's like the monastic era where, where they, were, they went in monasteries and they shut themselves away with the meaning of, you know, let's go and get into the presence of God. And be honest, Bishop, out of it did fall some reformation. However, uh, you know, there still needs to be work done. People still have to be reached. Now, I, I agree with you. If I'm in the presence of God more than I am just trying to do work, and I do agree, I should have his presence in order to do the work. We do the opposite. We do the work with no presence. So I think we need his presence. We do need to practice that. And we'll probably have to work uh, with less toil to do what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that's the problem with the church now is because there's less presence of God, we're working and toiling and running over the same issues because we have no presence. We'll get the job done, but we'll do it with less toil if we have more of the presence of God. Pastor Tim, how do we, how yeah, do we I, bring the people to that position then yeah. of of combining, like Pastor Brian says, we can do the work, but yeah. there'll be more effort Yeah, yeah. as opposed yeah. to, you know, I'm reminded of something that John Wesley is uh, alleged to have said. He said, I start my day uh, with five hours of prayer because yes. I have so much to do. And he said Absolutely. he realized that the more time he spent with God, God could handle mm. something in three minutes that would take him four hours to accomplish. How yes, do we sir. bring yeah. the people to that place, mm. Pastor Tim? Our audience, I'm sure the people of God that are watching us are wondering, how do I get to that place in God where he yes. flows through me as life to a dying world, as light to a dark world, to, mm. to impart the anointing that destroys yokes. How do we get 
our listeners to that place, Pastor Tim? Yeah, you know, Bishop, mo most people who are following someone, they become carbon copies of those individuals. So as mm -hmm. leaders, we have to get there first. Yeah. We have to be the first partakers of that. And, and, and by that, I mean that we must be the example. And the example is, you know, we, as you said, we spend so much time doing all of the, the work, right? And there's no real connectivity. And our job as leaders is to teach our people how to do that. And doing that is spending time in the presence of the Lord. It seems like a cliche, but that's really, there is no substitute Very, for spending time yeah. with God. There's no how substitute much time? for that. There is, you know what, I, Bishop, it, I, it depends on the individual, I think, but I think we should be, be you know, you talk about all of the, the time you spend watching TV and, 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 you know, doing your leisure pleasures, right? If we would take a portion of that time and yeah. spend that with the Lord, then we would see real moves of God as leaders. Oh. I think that we should spend a couple of hours a day at least yeah. talking to the Lord and speaking to the Lord. You know, whether it's an hour and a half in the a.m. and an hour and a half or an hour in the p.m., we have to in inundate ourselves and saturate ourselves with the presence of the Lord. You know, I have an app on my phone every Sunday morning. It gives me the time, the FaceTime or the screen time that I've spent on my phone. Wow. Yeah. Every every Sunday morning. And there have been some Sunday mornings that it pops up and I say, you know what? I got to reevaluate my time. You know, you you yeah. you know, you're in the supermarket and while you're in line, you're looking at your phone or you're you know, <laughs> you're you're having True. lunch and you're looking at your phone or, you know, True. or you just spending time looking at your phone. What would it be like if we were intentional about saying, you know what, the time that I spend on my phone, I'm going to give that to the Lord today. Yeah. How much power and authority would be garnered through that kind of relationship and connectivity? Endless power and authority, I would, I would hazard a guess and say. There's a fourth church in uh, that assessment that Jesus gives, and that's the church of Pergamon. Yeah. And the danger with that church is compromise. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up on two minutes of our time left when we begin to wrap up. But oh. Pastor Brian, I want you to give just a real quick assessment of compromise. If you can do it in about a minute, yes, because sir. I think this will so, uh, cause us to segue into where we really want to be to answer the questions of our precious listener here. Yeah. Have we compromised to the place where we have no more power? And I think we've compromised it away. And uh, not that we can't get it back. Thank God in here, the Holy Spirit has not gone anywhere. Yes. He's really waiting for us to get hungry again. Yes, yes. And I think the removal of the comforts, the removal of our everyday old normalcy, I think he's trying to drive us somewhere. I think he's trying to extract a hunger and a thirst so that he can fill it. And that's just the overall command of the scripture. Those that are hungry and thirsty, I will fill them. And the church, and I know us three, I know we're getting hungry for that move of God, for him to touch and, and take the toil away, take all the, the antics away and the sensationalism and help us to just be bold in faith. Comp uh, in order to compromise, you have to exchange it for boldness. Yes. And what we've given up for years, as we said, we don't need to be bold. We just need to be friendly. And I'm saying, no, we need to be mm. bold again and yes. let the gospel Amen. Let the word of God speak for itself. Let the word of God. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, we're coming to the close of this segment of The Christian and the Culture. Once again, we wanted to challenge you to stand up and speak up for God. Amen. Stand up yes. and speak yes. up for God. Speak against yes. those things that yes. uh, cause harm to the plan of God. Don't be afraid. God said, I'll be with you. I'll and if everybody you. else forsakes you, the Lord will still be with you. Yes. You've been watching the Christian and the culture. I'm pastor Eric Lambert of Bethel deliverance international church. And I thank you for joining us. And I pray that you continue to pray with us, join us and believe God for a supernatural move of the Holy spirit. Remember yes. you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. God yes. bless you. God bless you. God, God bless. bless you. Discover God's design for family through Bishop Eric Lambert's sermon series, Strengthening the Family. This powerful series will provide you with practical instruction on how to strengthen your family relationships 
using scriptures from the Word of God. Receive the five-part series, Strengthening the Family, on CD or DVD for your donation of $35 or more. To order, call 1-800-550-3284 or visit ericlambertministries.org. Get your copy of Strengthening the Family so you can build a family life that brings victory to your home and glory to God. Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is committed to influencing our culture with Christ. In his book, The Christian in the Culture, Bishop Lambert explores practical ways to avoid becoming ensnared by the trends of today's culture. Order your copy of The Christian in the Culture and achieve daily victorious living. Visit ericlambertministries.org to purchase the book and discover more resources that will enrich your Christian walk. The Bethel Deliverance app is now available to download for free at Apple Store and Google Play. You can tune into Sunday services through live stream, view video sermons on demand, listen to audio messages through podcasts, send prayer requests, communicate through social media, and you can contribute to the ministry simply by using today's technology. Get access to all of Bethel's media outlets and church events right at your fingertips. Go to the Apple Store or Google Play and download Bethel Deliverance to get connected today. Praise the Lord. I'm Bishop Eric Lambert. I want to welcome you to the Eric Lambert Ministries website. On this website, you will be able to get information about books, CDs, DVDs, and even the printed word designed to help you in your walk with Christ. You'll find information about our YouTube channel and the services that we have at Bethel Deliverance International Church. And we want you to understand that our ministry is designed to lift up Jesus, to glorify his name, and to get you, the listener, connected to the power of the Holy Ghost. I am excited about the Eric Lambert Ministries website, and I want you to join us as often as you can, and we guarantee two things. You'll have a closer walk with Jesus. Number two, your life will be richer. God bless you. Access resources that will enrich your Christian walk today by visiting ericlambertministries.org. That's ericlambertministries.org. The Climbing Higher broadcast with Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is a part of the media outreach ministry of Bethel Deliverance International Church. Our goal is to reach the world with powerful messages of faith, truth, and victory taught from God's Word. You can take part in this significant mission by becoming a media partner. Your weekly, monthly, or one-time gift goes directly towards reaching the masses with life-changing messages of hope from God's Word. To find out more, visit the BethelDeliverance.org media link for additional information about our partnership options. We thank you for your seeds of support. The Christian and the Culture is a production of Bethel Deliverance International Church. For more information about our media ministry or to partner with us, visit BethelDeliverance.org and go to the media outreach link to make a donation. Thank you for watching. Be blessed.